Let's take a look at example 12-2. In this problem, a shaft is shown in the figure receives 110 horsepower from a water turbine through a chain sprocket at point C. The gear pair at E delivers 80 horsepower to an electric generator. The V-belt shiv at A delivers 30 horsepower to a bucket elevator that carries green to an elevated hopper. The shaft rotates at 1700 RPM. The sprocket, shiv, and gear are located axially by a pair of retaining rings. The shiv and the gear are keyed with a sled runner key seats, and there is a profile key seat at the sprocket. We use SAE 1040 cold drawn steel for the shaft, and we're going to compute the minimum acceptable diameters D1 through D7 as shown in the figure. So let's analyze this situation. First off, we're given RPM and we're given three horsepower values. And what we have to do is calculate the three torque values at A, C, and E. The torque comes in at C in the middle of the shaft and it's distributed to the left at A and to the right at E, which means that there will be torque present at all the locations in the shaft. A complicating factor is that V-belt shiv at A is angled upward. You see in the bottom diagram it's oriented at 60 uh, degrees to the axis. And that means that when you go to calculate what the horizontal and vertical forces are, you're going to be using sines and cosines of that 60 degree angle to first calculate the bending force from the V-belt pulley and then resolve them into x and y directions. Same holds true for the chain sprocket. You're going to calculate the bending force on the shaft to the chain sprocket, but then that one's pitched at a 40 degree angle. It's going down in the picture, and you're going to have to resolve the force uh, into the x and y components. Now we turn to gear E and gear Q. The shaft shown holds shiv A, sprocket C, and gear E, but it doesn't hold gear Q. So we have to establish, is this an action case or a reaction case? Well, the problem says that gear E is driving gear Q, which means it's a reaction case. So gear E is rotating clockwise, and gear Q is going counterclockwise, which means that Gear E is exerting a tangential force on gear Q in the down direction, but gear Q is resisting with its equal and opposite reaction shown as WTE. And it's that upward force that actually acts on the shaft. So here's our design input. We show the different horsepower being delivered to gear E and A, and the pressure angle of 20 degrees and the size of the components. And also in this problem, the distance between the components is defined as six inches apart for all components. So now we need to calculate the forces on the shaft. And the first thing we do is draw a diagram showing the torque input and output. The torque input is in the middle at 110 horsepower coming in on chain sprocket C, which means that 30 horsepower is going to A from C and 80 horsepower is distributed to E. And once we know the horsepower and we know the RPM of the shaft, which was a given in this problem, we can calculate the torques on A, C, and E. And once we know the torques, we can calculate the forces on the shaft at E, the tangential and the radial forces. We know the sprocket force is just the torque divided by the diameter of two. And the force of the shaft at shiv A is 1.5 times the normal force of the shiv because this is a, a V-belt drive. And that's just equal to 1.5 times the torque at A divided by the diameter of 2. And note again that the forces on the shaft at shiv A and sprocket C are going to need to be resolved into Y components, which is the vertical direction, and X components, which is in and out of the page. So when we calculate the vertical forces, 
The two that are a little tough is to think about uh, what angle and what sine and cosine you use to get the y direction for the shiv and the sprocket. And we see that the y direction bending force on the shaft from shiv A is equal to 1 time, 1.5 times the normal force times the sine of 60 degrees. And the y direction bending force on the shaft from sprocket C is equal to the torque at C divided by the diameter of C over 2 and times cosine of 40 degrees, where the forces at A are up and the force at C is down. And again, the Y force at E is just the tangential force on the gear, which we said before was acting up. And we go to calculate the horizontal forces. We use the radial force on gear E. And in this case, the X direction bending force on the shaft from shiv A equals 1.5 times the normal force times cosine of 60 degrees. And the X direction bending force on the shaft from sprocket C is the torque at C divided by the diameter of C over 2 times sine 40 degrees. And in this case, both forces A and C are acting down on this force diagram, which means they're essentially coming out of the page, is, is how you would interpret it. And now we calculate the vertical shear force in the shaft and the bending moment in the vertical Y plane. Now, Oliver was on my table. And if we're wondering why, here is the evidence that's left behind. It's a little piece of kitty food. And not only is there kitty food, but look at all these cat hairs that Oliver left behind. Hmm. Hmm, Oliver. What do you have to say for yourself, Oliver? Well, this is what Oliver had to say to me. He's sticking his tongue out at me. I suppose when you don't have hands, this is the closest Oliver could get to flipping me the bird. See, Oliver. Now let's see. Where were we before Oliver so rudely interrupted us? Oh yes, we were calculating the vertical shear in the shaft. Well, you can see we've done that. We've summed our shear forces in the beam. And we have sort of a stair-step ladder where the forces are in the positive direction, meaning up on the left side of the shaft, and then, of course, they're negative on the right side of the shaft. And the bending moment curve looks almost like a perfect triangle, where the peak Y bending moment is right at point C, which was where the power comes in from the sprocket. And we don't have such a quite even picture in the shaft for the horizontal forces. It's more of a stair step up, down, up, down, and that's because of the location of the forces and the fairly evenness of all these uh, forces in the x direction. And the bending moment kind of goes the same. The numbers tend to be smaller than in the y uh, direction. In fact, the moment comes to near zero when you're uh, in the x direction in the middle of the shaft at that sprocket. And when we combine these moments, and we have to combine the moments at B, C, and D, uh, we see that the uh, bending moment in the shaft is peaked out right down in the middle. And because the uh, bending moments in the horizontal plane tend to be fairly low compared to the ones in the vertical plane, the numbers we get are fairly close to the moment in the vertical plane. And now we summarize our forces on the shaft and show you all the equations we've used to get this far. And the key issue again is that we've also solved for the upward Y forces and the outward X forces in the bearings D and B, which we're going to uh, have to use later when we figure out the critical diameters at different points in the shaft. Now let's start stepping through the shaft and calculating the minimum diameters. And we'll start at the left end at location of shiv A where the moment is zero. We do have 1,112 pound inches of torque at this end, and we do have two ring grooves. Now if you look at our equation 1224 with the moment being zero, uh, kT drops out of the equation, so we don't use kT equals three. 
But we do have the fact that when we calculate this diameter D1 of 0.65 inches, we're still calculating it at the base of the ring groove. And so we do need to increase this diameter by 6% and get D1 equal to 0.69 inches. And here's our spreadsheet doing the calculation. And again, those two ring grooves keep that shiv from moving uh, left or right. Not due to the forces on the shiv, but possibly due to other types of vibration in the shaft. Now diameter D2 at point B requires a fillet radius for the bearing seat where D2 meets D3. And this location has 1112 pound inches of torque, but it also has the calculated moment of 3339 pound inches. And because we have that fillet radius, we're using KT equal to 1.5. Again, using equation 1224, we get D2 equals 1.7 inches. And here's our calculation for D2. Now the diameter to the right of point B requires a sharp fillet to allow bearing B to seat against D4. And at that location, we do have torque and moment, and we assign a value of a KT equal to 2.5. And not surprisingly, the diameter D3 with the torque and the moment in there will be larger than D2, and we get 2.02 .02 inches for that diameter D3. And here's our calculation. Now you can see the moment values are getting large and we still have our torque. And we are using a stress concentration factor KT equal to 2.5. The diameter D4 at point C requires two ring grooves to keep the sprocket C from moving axially. This is a similar situation to what we had at point A. And we do have our highest torque levels and our highest moment levels in this shaft. And KT equals 3.0. So we would expect that the diameter at D4 would be quite large. And it turns out to be 2.57 inches. That's after applying our ring groove factor of 1.06. Here's our calculation. We see the large moment values and large torque values. The minimum shaft diameter came out to 2.42 inches, which when bumped up by the factor of 1.06 became 2.57 inches. Now diameter D5 at point D requires a sharp radius for the bearing seat where D4 meets D5. This very similar situation to what we had at point B. And likewise, KT is 2.5. And putting in our torque and moment values, we get D5 equal to 1.98 inches. And here's our calculation for D5. Diameter D6 to the right of point D requires a fillet radius for the bearing seat where D5 meets D6. So this was also a similar situation to what we had at point B. KT equals 1.5. And putting in the values of our torque and moment, we get D6 equal to 1.68 inches. Which should be a lower value because KT is only 1.5 in this case, and not 2.5. Now diameter D7 at point E requires two ring grooves to keep gear E from moving axially. And this is a very similar situation to our other components. But at this point, the moment is zero. We still have torque and normally we'd apply KT equals 3.0. But because M is zero, KT is not really in the equation for the diameter. And so we get a much smaller diameter of D7 equal 0.96. And here's our calculation of D7 where we see that the moment is zero. The shaft diameters are sometimes rounded up to even fractions for ease of buying raw material. And here is just showing you
based on some of these minimum diameters what someone might take a look at this shaft and round it up. You can see that at a minimum you're going to be buying a shaft that has to have a 2.57 diameter in it. And so in this case if you round it up to two and three quarters that would be more likely what you could purchase as round stock and then machine it down to the 2.57. And shaft diameters are sometimes rounded up to even fractions for ease of machining. And so in this case, we decided to make diameters D1, D2, D6, and D7 the same in order to minimize the machining. And it does provide a little extra safety factor at the ring grooves. And the bore sizes would have to be checked against the load ratings of the bearings. So you really can't just do this arbitrarily. You can only round up diameters case by case you also have to get the diameters right in order to purchase standard ring grooves so you have to use a lot of judgment here and to understand that better let's just take a look at some of the way we size the diameters the same you can see we made d1 d2 d6 and d7 all of the same at one and three quarters and what that would do is minimize the time that it takes to machine down the shaft because if you're starting at a two and three quarters diameter shaft and you gotta get all the way down to 0.69 that's gonna take a lot of time which means the parts going to be very expensive let's take a look at example problem 12-3 in this problem a worm gear is mounted at the right side of the shaft as shown below the gear delivers 6.68 horsepower to the shaft at a speed of 101 RPM. The other parameters are shown here in the diagram because this example was used as problem 10-9 back when we studied worm gears in chapter 10. We've already calculated the forces on the worm gear shown in the lower right hand corner. And we've already analyzed the forces showing that the worm gear does have three forces given off it's got the radial force it's got its tangential force and it does have an axial force the torque flows in uh, this problem from the gear which is driven by a worm that you don't see through bearing C and then out the chain sprocket the other side so that bearing A does not see any torque or any moment Here's all the input variables. They're all the same as in chapter 10's example. And when we analyze the forces, we see that the shaft holds gear D and sprocket B, it does not hold the worm that drives a gear D. And there is an axial force on the shaft due to the axial force in the worm gear, but we're only going to account for the moment from that axial force where, where it produces a moment on the shaft with a lever arm of 4.33 inches. We will not be accounting for the, the actual force that is along the axis of the shaft because that compressive force is very, very small compared to what a shaft this large uh, can support without deflecting. Now the force on the shaft due to sprocket B is going to be all in the X direction in and out of the page. And so we don't have to worry on any uh, Y forces, meaning up and down in this slide. And the forces on the shaft at gear D, the tangential, the axial, and the radial forces are all calculated from these complex worm gear equations we had in chapter 10. And in this case, we're just going to pull the numbers that we had in that example the tangential force is 962 pounds, the radial force is 352, and the axial force is 265 pounds. When we calculate the vertical forces, we see that the chain sprocket does not contribute at all, because all of its force is in and out of the page. And the radial force on the gear, 352 pounds, is what's shown in acting down in the Y direction. And the axial force, again, creates the moment, but we're not going to account for its uh, force. And the moment, again, is the axial force, three, 265 pounds times 4.33 inches. And when we look at the horizontal direction, we have the sprocket chain force of 1,242 pounds 
acting down, which is really out of the page in the way we've defined this. And we include the tangential direction force on gear D, in this case, acting out of the page, but shown in this free body diagram, diagram as acting down. And when we calculate the vertical shear in the shaft and the bending moment in the shaft, we find that the forces are fairly low, most because the sprocket didn't have any forces. And the only place we really have significant moment in the shaft is where the worm gear is located on the right hand side. When we calculate the horizontal shear force, on the other hand, the numbers are rather large. You go all the way from 962 pounds to minus 735 pounds. And as a result of that, the moments are very large in this shaft in the x direction. Moment being zero at points A and D, because those are the free ends of the shaft. And when we combine the moments in the shaft, we have some fairly large numbers, mostly dominated by the moments in the x direction. And here's a summary of not only some forces, but on this page we're showing you the same numbers that we had and torques and pitch line velocities and such from chapter 10. And in this slide we're summarizing for you solely the forces and how we got all these numbers in the shaft. And just like in prior problems, the forces in X and Y on the bearings and the moments are going to be what we use in order to calculate the minimum shaft diameter. And as before, we step through the shaft of all locations, calculate the shaft diameter using the various formulas we have here in chapter 12. And starting at the left, location of bearing A, torque and moment are both zero at this location. And so we use our equation D for diameter equals square root of 2.94 kT times V, which is the shear, times safety factor numbers and divided by S prime N. And we get that the diameter is 0.588 inches. KT is 2.5 because we have to have a bearing A mount on the shaft with a sharp fillet, just like the way it mounted as a press fit in the prior two examples. And here's the summation for how we calculated diameter D1. Diameter D2 at point B requires two rings to mount the chain sprocket. This will keep that chain sprocket from moving left and right. And we did have a torque of 4,168 pound inches at this location and a moment of 2,543 pound inches KT equals 3.0 for bending because of the existence of the ring grooves. We calculate the diameter D2 at the base of the groove at 1.93 inches. And when we add our 6% factor, we see that the majority of D2 will be sized for 2.05 inches. Here's our summary for the calculation of D2. Diameter D3 at point C and to the right has a sharp fillet for the bearing seat. And that gives us KT for 2.5. It had the largest torques and moments. And so it gets a diameter D3 of 2.26. Here's our calculation showing how we got our diameter D3. Now we don't calculate D4 because we know it has to be much greater than D3. And the left side of D4 where the bearing is would actually be where we would do the calculation. And because of that, we can save a step here and just decide what D4 is just on the, the need to act as a shoulder for the bearing. Again, get into more of that in chapter 14. And so we just need to calculate diameter D5 at point D, where at D5 acts as a key seat to mount the gear. The gear can't move left because it's hitting up against D4. Now in this example, we're showing KT equals 1.6 because we're using a sled runner key seat on the right side 
the edge of the shaft to hold the key. I suppose if I were to design this shaft, I would not only do that, but I would want some type of groove there so that I would prevent this gear from moving to the right. Because with just a key seat, that doesn't really stop the motion to the right. It stops the torque when you put the key on. In other words, it transfers the torque from the shaft to the gear or from the gear to the shaft, depending on how you want to look at it. But we'll go in this problem for kt equal 1.6 because that's how they did it in the book. But just be advised that if you design a shaft and you do allow any parts to just free walk down the length of a shaft, that's probably not going to work. So here's our calculation for diameter D5. It does use stress concentration factor 1.6 and that gets you a minimum shaft diameter in this case of 1.24. And using round numbers for the shaft diameters as suggested in the book, they're showing that you uh, take these minimum numbers and you produce standard numbers per inch decimal usage. Key issue here is they're just saying that D4 has to be somewhat greater than D3 because you must have a shoulder against which bearing C sits. That's it for this lecture. And we'll see you guys next time for the next lecture. Thanks.